going on, Pathway Church? This is Pastor Sam. I hope you're doing good. Welcome back to our study, The Original Game of Thrones, where we're going through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. And what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the decline of King Saul, or the continued decline of King Saul, but we're also going to get into the beginnings of the rise of David as the king of Israel. Now, you all know it's Halloween, and we're getting to that time of year where kids are, you know, picking out Halloween costumes and the mask and things like that they're going to wear. This is my son's mask from last year. He wanted to be Miles Morales. He wanted to be Spider-Man. And, of course, he puts the costume on, you know, puts the mask on, and he act, he's acting like he's shooting webs and climbing around on the furniture and, and attempting to climb the walls and things like that. Uh, and as I thought about that, I thought about, you know, one of the things I think we don't realize, especially as Christians, is that we put masks on more than just one time a year. Uh, many times we probably put masks on almost on a daily basis because we're pretending sometimes to be people that we're really not. Now, sometimes that comes from maybe what we think is an admirable characteristic. Maybe we're just trying to protect other people from what's going on internally uh, we don't want to know people. We want we don't want people to know how we're struggling and and some of the frustrations we have, and so we pretend everything's okay when it's not. Or it may be coming from a more nefarious motivation where we're pretending to be better people than we really are, much like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, whom he called hypocrites. And the Greek word for that is a play actor. They were pretending to be something they really weren't. They were performing, looking for the applause of people. This is what we're going to see in. King Saul in chapter 15. Now, you were with us last time. We talked a little bit about this, and we talked about how much he cared about what people thought versus what God thought about him. And if you remember, he was given the command to completely and utterly wipe out the Amalekites. Saul doesn't do that. However, he does win a great battle. And so on that day, Saul appears to be a victorious man. He is gaining the applause of the people. People are probably shouting his name. He has even taken the opportunity to set up a monument for himself. And as good as things looked, the prophet Samuel comes and he sheds light on what's really going on. He confronts Saul, and in doing so, he basically says this. Saul comes to Samuel and he says, Look, God has brought a great victory. We have beat the Amalekites, and, and, and we're about to offer sacrifice. And Samuel says, well, did you do what God called you to do? Did you do what God said do? And Saul says, oh, of course we did. And here's Samuel's response in verse 14 of chapter 15. He said, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of cattle which I hear? And, of course, Saul said, well, the Amalekites, you know, were tough and the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen and sacri to sacrifice to the Lord. So Saul is trying to make... This seemed like an admirable thing that has been done. We, no, we didn't. We, 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 we did what God called us to do. And I know we didn't utterly destroy everything like you said, but we've kept it as a sacrifice to God. And the people wanted this. And of course, Samuel, and he's the man. Uh, in, ver, in verse 16, Samuel looks at Saul. Now, Saul's the king. He holds Samuel's life in his hand, and he essentially says, Be quiet. Let me tell you what the Lord showed me tonight or last night. And, of course, Samuel says, okay, we'll speak on. And he basically tells Saul, look, you're going to lose your kingdom as a result of this. And, uh, and then he culminates his speech with this in verse 22. Has the Lord great delight in burnt offering and sacrifice, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of the rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So here Saul is wanting to make like he's religious and spiritual and offer all these sacrifices before the people. And Samuel comes in and he sheds light on the true nature of Saul's heart, a man who is stubborn, a man whose heart is full of idols, who is only, his only intent is to make a name for himself and to look good in the eyes of all the people. And uh, Saul doesn't like this very much. And you would think, maybe confronted with this truth, Saul would repent, that Saul would be sorry. Saul may would get up in front of the people and say, look, we didn't do what God called us to do. Let's ask for God's forgiveness. But Saul doesn't do that. We get a glimpse into Saul's heart where he basically says in verse 30, I have sinned yet, okay? When you all, whenever we start a sentence, I've sinned, I messed up, but, all right, there's a problem. 
That's not real confession. That's not a broken, a broken spirit, a contrite heart. That's not what that is. Saul says, I have sinned yet. Honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. So, what's, so, so what we see is it's, it's kind of you know under the surface here, but what you see is a, a glimpse, an insight into Saul's heart. He is intent on looking good in front of everybody. I know I sinned, but Lord, come on, Samuel. Let's don't make a big deal out of this. Let's just go before the elders. Everybody will know God loves me and God approves of me. Again, he cares more about how he appears than how, before people than how he appears before God. Now, here's the big point that I want to make today, and it is this. Authentic Christians are victorious Christians, right? Authentic Christians are victorious Christians. And as we look at Saul and then we look at David as he goes throughout his life, that's what we're going to notice. We're going to see Saul as a man full of pretense, a man who is literally playing the hypocrite. He is a play actor. He is performing for the applause of people. David, on the other hand, is a man who seeks to please God. He doesn't care how he looks in front of people. We see that when he dances before the Ark of the Covenant and his kingly robes fall off. He don't care how he, he only cares how he looks in the eyes of God. And so Saul is rejected this day because of his inauthenticity. And this is important for us. Again, because it what pretense, this play acting that we do, putting on the mask, can lead to the corruption and the desolation of our soul if we're not careful. It's like ignoring, you know, dangerous symptoms that tell you, hey, you're sick, something's going wrong, you might need to go to the doctor. But we just pretend everything's okay. That's what happens in our lives. And if we're not careful, just like that, that you know, small, insignificant symptom completely ignored over time could lead to something very dangerous and even deadly, so is the same, so it's the same way with sin. Sin's the same way. We ignore it. We pretend it's not there. Or we think it's not that bad. Saul had fooled himself into thinking he was actually probably a better person than he really was. He probably thought what he did wasn't that bad. He is so far gone that his soul is now left desolate. The Bible says an evil spirit would basically come and torment him for the rest of his days as a result of this. You know why he was tormented? Because he felt he was in the right all the time. He felt he was a righteous person. Again, because he was inauthentic, because he refused to confess his sins before God and make himself accountable before others and admit when he had done wrong, he always felt like he was justified, always felt like he was in the right place. I'm convinced that's what tormented Saul. He said, he, all of this has happened to me, and I don't deserve any of it because I've been a good man. That, I'm convinced that's what tormented him through, for the remainder of his days. But here's what Samuel has to say to, or God has to say to Samuel. As Samuel, or as God tears the kingdom from Saul, Samuel mourns. And God says, don't mourn for him anymore. Get your horn of oil, go to Bethlehem, and there you will find the next king to shepherd my people. And, of course, Samuel does that. He goes to Bethlehem. The elders get a little nervous because Samuel was not someone to be trifled with. In fact, when Saul failed to kill the king of, uh, Am of the Amalekites, Agag, the Bible says Samuel took his sword and hacked him to pieces before the Lord. So, the, understandably, the people there in Bethlehem are a little bit nervous when Samuel shows up. So when Samuel shows up, he gathers the elders together. They offer a sacrifice. He takes Jesse to the side says, Look, I, I need to see your sons. And, of course, as he sees the first son, he is tall, dark, handsome, a man who looks like a king. And Samuel says to himself, surely this is the man you have called to be the next king of Israel. Not the case. Here's what God says. Don't look on his outward appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And so Samuel goes through the remainder of, of Jesse's sons till they get to the end. He says, are there no more sons? And Jesse kind of sighs and says, well, I reckon we, we got one more, uh, the youngest son, David, but he's out keeping the sheep. Wow, man. That says a lot about this young man, all right? He's doing the menial jobs. He's taking care of the sheep. He's doing the thing nobody else wants to do. And I'm going to tell you why, the man, why he's out there. This is a young man that's writing songs, 
that sees himself in the eyes of God, that cares more about what God thinks than what people think. This is going to be the next shepherd of God's people. Samuel says, we're going to stay right here, go get him, bring him back. And when he sees him, there God speaks to Samuel and says, that's the man, that's the man I've chosen to shepherd my people. And so Samuel takes the horn of oil, he pours over David's head and anoints him the next king of Israel in front of all of his brothers. Now, there's a little bit of this that disturbs me, you know, at least on the surface. We look at Saul. Actually, what Saul did doesn't seem to be that bad. Uh, we look at this man, and, and one of the things we notice is that, um, is that, you know, all he does really is he offers a sacrifice before it's time because people are walking away during the battle. We would think that we could excuse that. As, you know, that's a common sense thing to do. Uh, he is actually shows mercy on the Amalekites and doesn't completely slaughter everyone and actually keeps the king alive. We would think that, but he, he doesn't do it for those purposes. And, and I look at that, and there's some of me that kind of sympathizes with Saul and say, God, Lord, ain't you being a little bit too hard on him? But the problem is Saul saw this man, or God saw this man's heart, and he knew what was in the man's heart. And this is a man, again, stubborn, a heart full of idolatry, a man who uh, desired the applause and the appreciation of people rather than the applause of heaven. And so God knew what was in this man's heart. And then I look at David and I see this is, this is a man who was good. He was good at sinning. Uh, he, he, cheated, uh, he, had a, uh, he cheated on his own wife with another woman who was married. That brings that man home from the battlefield, one of his own soldiers, ends up having him murdered so he could take his wife. That's sin right there, buddy. And I'm telling you, I look at that and I'm thinking, how in the world can you get so angry at Saul and yet David is a man after your own heart? But the difference is how they react, how they respond when confronted with their sin. Saul makes excuses. Saul just cares how he looks in front of people. David is completely broken and contrite. In fact, he is repentant. And when Nathan comes to David and says, you're the man that uh, stole this little lamb. You know, he tells a story about, you know, a, a rich man stealing a poor man's lamb. He said, you're that man. David breaks down, weeps, and prays for days, seeking God's forgiveness. This shows us a lot about that man. This shows us a lot about David. And one of the things we need to understand is, again, we look at the Psalm 51 where David repents over this sin, and he says it's, it's not sacrifice and offering you want. You don't want my ritual. You don't want me to just look good. You don't want me to just go to church and read my Bible and go through the motions. You don't want that, God. You want a broken spirit, a broken and, and contrite heart, oh God, you will not despise. The word broken there, it, it essentially means to, to tear violently, to crush to wreck is what the word broken. And what God wants, he wants our heart wrecked because he wants us to see how devastating sin is. Uh, he wants us to know the, the, the consequences of sin. It separates us from God. And David knew that. And, and every time he found himself in the midst of sin, he never excused that sin. He always repented, always sought restoration from God. The word uh, broken or the word contrite means to be crushed into pieces. How many of us, we need to be crushed for our sin. We need to be reminded how awful our sin is. Saul could not cover his sin with sacrifices. No matter how many bulls or sheep he offered, it wasn't going to work. Why? Because he was not repentant. He was not broken. He was not contrite. He was not authentic. He pretended to be something he wasn't, and he continued that pretense up until the day of his death. You know, many of us think because we go to church, we've done our duty, so now, therefore, God owes us. Or because I prayed or because I read the Bible, God owes me now. And that's the way Saul felt. Where David felt, on the other hand, I owe God everything. I could never repay him. He would bear his soul in the Scripture as a result of his sin. And here's what that means for Boy, us. I'll just be real. If we're Christians, we need to understand that the cross frees us from all pretense. We don't have to pretend because what the cross does, it, 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 it's, its sheer present is a presence is a declaration to our depravity and the fact that we need God's mercy and grace. And so we can't, if you're a Christian, you can't just pretend everything's okay because it's not. The cross says it's not. The cross says you need help. You need a Savior. 
And so what we need to do is be honest about our need, be honest about our failings, our mistakes, our shortcomings, and our need for God's grace and mercy. And there's no reason to be ashamed, no reason to not say, I've messed up and need help. Now, here's what that doesn't mean. Now, it doesn't mean that we just keep on sinning. It doesn't give us an excuse to sin. You know, uh, you know, the word authentic is bantied around a lot in you know, evangelical circles. And sometimes people kind of take that to excuse their sin. No, just because I'm honest about my sin doesn't mean I can just keep on sinning as if nothing has happened. In fact, Paul kind of addresses this in Romans 6. He said, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. Certainly not. This cannot be. Okay, we are given God's grace that we may change. We're given God's grace that we may not only recognize our need for a Savior and the sin and the separation that's caused between us and God, but that we may become more like Christ. It is by the grace of God, Paul said, I am what I am. I am not what I once was, and I am not what I will be one day, but I am growing daily to become more like Christ. That's the big deal here. So here's a couple things I want to kind of leave you with. First of all, if we're going to be authentic people, we need one. Just like David, we need solitude. This is a man that spent many hours along watching over his father's sheep. And there he would ponder the deep things of God. There he would develop a relationship with God. There he would know that the gaze of God saw past all pretense. And we need to have that kind of time for ourselves alone with God. We need that solitude. He would examine himself. He would think deeply about his own heart and about God. We need that solitude where we can see God more clearly, see ourselves more clearly. We can get into the scripture and know who this God is and what this God expects from us. Now, number two, we need companionship. And I know these seem to be at odds with one another, but we need both of these. We need companionship. We need trusted people who will correct us and encourage us. We need that objective voice in our life that says, hey, you might want to check yourself here. Um, you know, Samuel was that for Saul, but Saul refused to listen. Sam Samuel warned Saul time and time again, but Saul's heart had grown cold and indifferent. And again, he cared more about what people thought than he did what God thought. You look at Paul, even in the New Testament. Paul corrects Peter, an apostle, right? A man who was with Jesus for three years. Paul wasn't, but, Je but, but Peter was. And you know what? Paul corrects him. We need companionship. We need people to correct us from time to time. That's why it's important to be involved in a small group at church. or That's why it's important to have a group of friends you pray with on a regular basis. That's why it's important that you and your wife spend some time together and that you're, you're willing to receive correction from one another, but also encourage one another. So we need those two things if we're going to be authentic Christians. Again, authenticity leads to victory. In the next chapter, one of the things we find is that David will defeat Goliath. Why? Because this was a man who was authentic. Not a man who cared what people thought. Not a man who was pretending to be something he wasn't. In fact, Saul would put David's armor on him uh, in an attempt to kind of prepare David for the battle. And David said, this is not who I am. I'm going to be who I am, right? I'm going to be authentic. And, and we can't pretend to be something we're not. And if we're going to be authentic and victorious, we have to have that time of solitude before God. And we have to have companionship that will hold us accountable. I want to read this quote, and I'll, I'll end with this. This is from Tim Keller. The gospel of justifying faith means that while Christians are in themselves still sinful and sinning, yet in Christ, in God's sight, they are accepted and righteous. What a wonderful promise for us. Though we are still sinners, we are still accepted by God as righteous. Moving on. So we can say that we are more wicked than we ever dared to be right? You're probably more wicked than you realize, but more loved and accepted in Christ than we ever hoped at the very same time. This creates a radical new dynamic for personal growth. It means that the more you see your own flaws and sins, the more precious, electrifying, and amazing God's grace appears to you. But on the other hand, the more you're aware of God's grace and acceptance in Christ, the more able you are to drop your denials and self-defenses and admit the true dimensions of your character 
and character of your sin. What an awesome quote. Go back and listen to that again. Meditate on it. One, it's like Martin Luther said, one and at the same time, sinner and saint. But I'm growing, and every day I'm becoming more like Christ because I'm honest with myself, I'm honest with God, I'm honest with other people who will hold me accountable, and I'm saying, God, change me. That's my heart's desire. I'm not trying to justify myself. I'm not trying to just be good in front of people. I'm concerned about pleasing God. Pleasing God starts with authenticity. God bless you all.